now in time, and we've kind of consistently walked through the uh, Matthew 24, incorporating Daniel, the book of Daniel, and the book of Revelation into that. And, uh, you know, people can have different thinkings and different uh, understandings about when the Lord will come. We said there are those who believe the Lord will come before the seven-year tribulation. That's called the seven-year tribulation period. There are those who believe that Christ will come in the middle of the week, after the first three and a half years. And they are called mid-trib, mid-tribulation. And then there are those that believe that Christ will come at the end of the tribulation or seven-year period, and those are called post-tribulation. Brother Irvin Baxter, um, some of you may have seen his, uh, his materials. Uh, I think he has a TV program, and, and uh, he, he, he is a post-tribulation person and been in our movement for a long, long time. I agree with a lot of what he says, with the exception and I believe that the Jesus Christ will come prior to the wrath of God. There, there's where I put it, and that's where I see it. I think we've taken enough time and looked at the scriptures to show you that uh, the wrath of God is not poured out upon the people of God. It's poured out upon the nations of this world, and specifically upon the Antichrist and those who take the mark. So what I want to do is I want you to turn to Matthew the twenty fourth chapter because we're gonna we're just gonna read some passages. I want to make some comments, and then you have a handout sheet tonight that I want to go through very quickly the book of Revelation. And may I say concerning Sunday service, we had a great service with the boarders. Uh, they they were wonderful missionaries, and we did uh, take them on. Uh, we had a couple families, a couple three families, take them on as partners. So. Uh, our work, our sharing in the work in New Zealand is from a bundle of life. So, thank the Lord for, for your generosity. Praise God. All right, let's look at Matthew 24. Now, we, we said in verse 30, let me just start there because that's where we kind of finished last week. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Remember Acts, the first chapter? This same Jesus, if you've seen go away, is going to come back in like manner. Well, this is it. Didn't say he was going to sneak in the back door, take the saints, go away, and then come back again. Said he's going to come back in exactly the same manner that you've seen him go. How did he go in Acts chapter 1? With clouds and glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, here's where we're going to pick it up. I want you to just follow me for a moment. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When the branch is yet tender and put it four leaves, you know, everyone say, you know. You know the summer is not. Why? Because the fig tree is putting forth its leaves. Pretty common sense. You know that summer is not. You know that the season is upon us. So, likewise, ye, when you shall, what? See all these things, know that it is near even at the door. Make sense? What is he talking about? Well, he just told you what he's talking about. It's coming. The second coming. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that generation, speaking of that generation right then. Yeah. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of the day and hour knoweth no man. Not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But, he says in verse 37, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So as, as we read about the conditions in Noah's day, violence filled the world. History tells us that if God had not destroyed the world and the planet at that time, that disease would have destroyed mankind and violence would have destroyed mankind. So he says, for as the days, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. At, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until... What is that next word? The day 
Everyone say the day. The day. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, it's, it's important to understand the analogy. Noah entering into the ark of safety and the saints being resurrected and raptured into our ark of safety. And he says, they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, and one other left. Have you ever heard this passage preached on about uh, the rapture of the church? Right. Yeah, I did. I even preached on it. When I when I uh, had my previous thinking, I used this passage. I preached on it. I was going to be kept taken, and I was going to be left. Suffer tribulation. But let me share with you what this passage does say. It doesn't say that. He just got, he got through telling you in verse 39... That they didn't know anything was going on until the flood came and did what? Took them away. Then he says, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken away, and the other one left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken away, and the other left. What's he talking about here? He's talking about taken away in judgment. He took, he took them all away in verse 39. Now, verse uh, 40 and 41, he's talking about people being taken away in judgment. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. We don't know the hour. That's why we have to persevere. He that endureth to the end, to the, end. The, same the same shall be saved. There's no point in our Christian life where we ever give up. And he's, he's trying to help us to understand that you have to endure all the way to the end. Because you don't know the hour. Wouldn't it be a shame to endure all of, all of these things up until the last hour? Cave in, give up, and then the Lord come the next hour? Wouldn't that be a shame for anyone? Sure it would. But know this. Now here's what he's saying. This is all in the context of his coming. But know this. That if the good men of the house had known in what, hour, uh, what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not suffer his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man coming. So he's telling you, look, you know, if, 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 you, if you knew what watch the thief was going to come, you would have stayed awake. You wouldn't have suffered that. So you need to stay awake. Be ready. Be watchful. Be aware. Don't let anybody steal your crown. So then he says, who then is faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household? And giveth them mean in his due season. Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him, and here again, he'll make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he doth not when he looketh no, not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware of, he shall cut him asunder and pour him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, he says, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Now, again, he's, he's talking about preparation. He's talking about being aware. He's talking about uh, uh, being prepared. Having your lamps trimmed. Now, in, in this whole in this whole uh, passage here about the ten virgins, five were wise, five were foolish. They all slumbered and slept. Yeah. But only half of them took extra oil with them. They were not prepared for the long duration. So we, we understand. Then he says in verse 14, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country. Who called his own servants and delivered them as goods. And he gave unto them, and he, you know that he traded them in. And uh, then verse 19. Now notice this verse 19. And if you mark your Bible, you might want to mark these things. He says, after a long time. Now again, what is he talking about here? This is the whole dissertation concerning end time events. So he says, after a long time. After a long time, uh, the Lord of those servants cometh and he reckoned with them. And you know the whole story concerning all of that. 
the one that went out and hid the talent, he called a wicked servant. And uh, so look at verse 29. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he, that hath, and he shall have abundance. But for him that hath not shall be taken away even what he has. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. Now look at verse 21. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Remember, he's going to come in clouds and glory. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the millennial reign. And before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes on, I was hungry, and you, you know, so, there, so he, he divides the nations. <clears throat> uh, one, one other point there in verse 46. He talks about, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So there, there you have. There, the, these, two, uh, these two chapters, chapters 24 and 25, deal with the, with the end time events and the coming of the Lord. Is there any question that you have uh, on, on this aspect here? All right, now let's turn to Revelation, the first chapter. We're just going to go through a couple things here. I'm going to share some things with you. As we look at the book of Revelation, again, I, I took down the chart, but it's important to understand that when you look at the book of Revelation, it is not in consecutive order. Now, we were always taught that it was. And that, you know, you had your seven seals, followed by seven trumpets, followed by seven bowls of wrath. But I'm going to show you that that's not really the way Revelation is, is laid out. Otherwise, you have the exact same event happening three times. And that's an impossibility. So, I, I want to share some things with you, at least the overall principles. Obviously, there's always some verses in, in, in uh, the book of Revelation as there are in the scriptures. The, uh, Paul says we see through a glass darkly, don't we? We don't have full, complete understanding. But Jesus did say in Matthew 24, and the revelation was given to Daniel and to John, that there were some things you are going to see, you're going to be able to observe. And when you see those things, he says, when you watch those things start to happen, then you know that the coming of the Lord is, is close. So, you know, we've been preaching, a, a, a majority of the Christian world has been preaching a pre-tribulation rapture for almost 200 years now. And any moment, Christ could come any moment. So why hasn't he come? If for 200 years... The Christian church is focused primarily that Christ could come any moment. Then why hasn't he come? Well, the reason why he hasn't come is because of stuff that needs to happen first. Right? Because he said he, he's laid it out what needs to happen. And what's going to happen. And he says when you observe these things, when you see these things start to transpire... Now you know. We don't know the exact day nor the hour. But he says, when you see these things, what we read it last week, lift up your heads, what? For your redemption is drawing nigh. So you're going to be able to know. And and the, the final message of the book of Revelation is even so, come, Lord Jesus. So let's let's look at this. You have this sheeted from me, and I'm going to make some comments, and we're just going to flip through the book of Revelation. And if you have a question, then you can, you can ask it. My main point in, in sharing this with you, and again, my, my journey in this started when I was about 25. And I began to look at the scriptures, began to search them out, and uh, study it, and it just things that I've been taught, things I've been taught in Bible college, things I've been taught uh, in, in, in church, uh, didn't match up with what I saw in, in the scriptures. And uh, in the last probably 25 years, 
The estimates are now that there's probably about 25, 30% of the Christian community who has changed some of their thinking concerning end time events. Where almost everybody was a pre-tribulation, you had a certain percentage that was mid-trib and a very small percentage that was post-trib. There's been a shift in thinking as people begin to look at the scriptures and you know, we have the advantage of being in this end time because we're seeing some of these things that were prophesied hundreds and thousands of years ago start to come to pass before our eyes. Some people will ask me, where does America fit in, in prophecy? Well, there's, if you look at a lot of prophecy, it has to do with the geographical location of, of the nation of Israel. A lot of it has to do with those countries that surround it. I mean, you don't, see, you don't see North America in prophecy. You don't see South America in prophecy. You don't see Australia in prophecy. You know, you don't, you don't, there's a lot, a lot of it had to do with the ge geography surrounding Israel in its prophetic utterances. That doesn't mean we're not in prophecy somewhere. Uh, is America on the decline? Absolutely. Is America going, I mean, the... the the guy who did the, the fall, of, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire said there were five ingredients that caused the fall of the Roman Empire. And he says these ingredients are generally that become evident at, at the decline of a, an empire and a, of a nation. And they'll start to go down from there and they will soon ex cease to exist. And, and we have all five of them in America today. And, and the thing that has, um, I think, surprised me, because when I looked at it, I said, well, okay, you know, how, how does this come to be? How, how does some of this stuff come to be when America is such a superpower in the world? You know, how, how and a few years ago, I was asking myself, well, America is such the economic engine of the world, you know, how, how can all this transpire? Well, we saw that in a few short months, the economy of the United States of America tanked, and we were we were on the verge of we were on the verge of economic crisis and collapse, and it was only our ability to print money out of thin air that has kept America afloat. I read t this past week: twenty-three nations of the world are now bankrupt and in negative interest rates. 23 nations of the world are now bankrupt and in negative interest rates. Japan's economy has, has flatlined and gone negative for the last 10 years. They are, right now, their debt load is 250% of their gross uh, domestic product. What that means is if you take everybody's money and, everybody, and every, every uh, business in Japan, you take it all. You take everything, every single cent and dollar that they make for one year. It would take two and a half years to pay their debt. That's nobody having anything. We're right now approaching 150% here in America. So you cannot continue to go debt like we have gone and the next. And Europe is already bankrupt, which I think is going to set it up for somebody to come to power with some kind of answer. Because all the nations, pretty much with the exception of Germany, half the European common market are, are bankrupt right now, and the other half are on the verge with the exception of Germany. And Germany is going to say, I'm not going to put the bill for all these people who just spend. You remember Greece? Greece was bankrupt. You know what, why they were bankrupt? Because they retire at 50. And the government has to support everybody. Well, you can't, you can't use insane economic policies and expect anything different. So what we're seeing right now before our eyes is the whole economic upheaval and potential collapse of the world economically. Now, will it happen in the next five years? I don't know. Will it happen in the next ten? I suspect. You, we can't do what we're doing right now. We are $20 trillion in debt. That is just what we borrow. That's not counting the unfunded liabilities that we have, such as Medicare and Medicaid, for, for, for the foreseeable future. If you add all that in, 
That's $200 trillion that the United States of America owes. There's no way in your lifetime, my lifetime, or a thousand lifetimes that we can ever pay that back. There's no way. And the only thing that's kept America afloat from having uh, hyperinflation is the fact that interest rates are so low. Because the moment you jack up the interest rate, the debt that we owe on $20 million, trillion, can, can you imagine what the, the, the cost of that money is for every percent of interest that we have? See, Joanne knows because she's in banking. <laughs> But when, when you start going up, and, and, and so our, our interest rates have been artificially kept suppressed. Now, they'll tell you there's not been inflation, but I can tell you in the last two years, there's been 25% inflation. How do I know? Because go down and go shopping and you get 25% less than what you did two years ago. You don't get a pound of anything anymore. You get 12 ounces, and it costs you the same. Isn't that a 25% increase? Absolutely. So though the government manipulates the, 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 the figures and tells you there's no inflation, there's been inflation. I read yesterday. I read yesterday. What was that figure back in 1975? You'd have to make twice what you're making today to equal the purchasing power of 1975 here in the United States of America. And if anybody does a shopping, you know. You know. People are having to do with, with less, so the prosperity. So where is America in this? I, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I do know that America's ability to do what it used to do is not there anymore. Now, whether we're going to sit on the sidelines or be a participator in some of this remains to be seen. That's why we need to be watchful and prayerful and uh, above all, be ready about anything. But America is in decline. I love my country. I pray for my country. But all the elements are there. I read an advertisement on somebody, you know, a, a Trump says, make America great again. Somebody else came up with, make America gay again. And there's t-shirts and hats and all that sort of thing. We're in a country in decline when one when less than two percent of the population that is that is a, 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 a homosexual or transgender can dictate to the ninety eight percent of the of the United States population and have the power and the leverage that that they have. We know we're in a country in decline, so it's important for us to just be aware of what's going on. Let's not stick our heads in the sand and say, well, it can never happen to us. We need to be diligent about winning the lost. Amen? We need to be diligent about being aware of what's going on in our world. Keep our eyes open uh, and our ears open to what's going on and just be aware. But ultimately, folks, we need to draw a line in the sand and say, this is where I stand. This is where I stand. I am a Christian. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. And stand up for your faith. All right, let's look at Revelation. Look at this. Chapter 1 in Revelation is, first of all, just an image of Jesus Christ. Before the Lord was able to give uh, uh, the, uh, John the revelation, he had to have a fresh vision and a revelation of Jesus Christ himself. You know, John lived with Jesus for three and a half years. He followed him. He touched him. He handled him. He says so in his epistles. You know, we saw him, we heard him, we were right there, we ate with him. You know, we did the high five together, we did all that. But see, John had not seen Jesus in this way. So God had to reveal to John a, a picture of him that he had not seen before. And so chapter one is the judge and the king introduced. Chapter two and three are your private letters to the churches of Asia, and we've been dealing with those in our morning worship for a few weeks here as, as time and uh, our Sundays will allow. <clears throat> so God is saying to the churches, here's what I want you to know. I just want to make a point that in chapter 22, uh, Jesus says to John, "These I want you to send all that you just got here to the seven churches of Asia. 
I want you to send them to the church. So, you know, people who say that the church is not relevant after chapter 4, it, it's, that's an impossibility, and I'll show you why it, it's an impossibility. All right, chapters 2 and 3 deal with the private letters to the saints and to the churches in Asia. Chapter 4, uh, the throne is set. And I'd like to, I'd like to describe chapter 4 as a true, genuine worship service. Chapter 4 gives you an image of the throne and the image of heaven that we would not have if we didn't have chapter 4 of Revelation. So chapter 1 gives us an image of Jesus Christ. Chapter 2 and, two and 3, he's laying down the groundwork, giving letters and instruction, and uh, he that overcomes to the seven churches of Asia. Chapter 4, you're seeing this awesome worship service. Four and twenty elders, the four bees. Rest not day or night to say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So you're seeing a, you're seeing a picture of the throne. And it's a beautiful, awesome picture. John said, when I saw it, he's trying to describe it with language that he knows and he can't. He says, it looks like a sea of glass. It was so bright, I couldn't, I couldn't make it out, but I could, I could tell that there was only one sitting on the throne. And he starts trying to describe what he saw with the language that he had. And he can't. It's a wonderful worship service. <clears throat> In chapter 5, the books are open. And uh, you, you see, again, you're seeing the majesty and the awesomeness around the throne and what God is doing. And it's a wonderful, wonderful picture of salvation in chapter 5. Now, there's a lot of imagery. So when, when the Bible says, some people will say, well, you know, for the doctrine of the Trinity, well, see here in chapter 5, you've got this lamb, you know, going over to the one that's on the throne. We know that lamb is representative of Christ. I said, okay, is this imagery? Is this imagery? Is this literal? I said, oh, no, it's, it's, it's literal. Oh, I said, okay. you got a lamb that looks like he's slain, walking on his back, on his hind legs, over to the one that sits on the throne and gives him a book. It is imagery. And it's imagery concerning salvation and the work of Jesus Christ to bring about salvation. Now, again, don't forget, if, you, if, if I can drive anything home into your thinking, there are two kingdoms. <coughs> There's a kingdom of God and there's a kingdom of man. Kingdom of darkness. And they're at odds with one another. And you and I will live our lives either believing the word of God or the word of man and Satan. It's no more complicated than that. And so these two kingdoms are at war with one another that culminates with what we see here in the battle of Armageddon. Don't forget that the heathens, the nations rage against God. Because the God of this world has caused them to do so. That this world and this world system is anti-Christ and anti-God. Don't ever forget that. That's why, folks, you and I are strangers and pilgrims and sojourners in this world. We have a world that's coming. So the books are open. All right, now chapter 6 deals with the seals. And I want you to think about the seals here, and I'm not going through all of them, but I just want you to think about the seals as being a, a, a broad picture. It's like seeing a broad picture of what's going to happen as we approach the end. All of this, folks, all of this deals with primarily the last seven years. So just keep that in mind. This, the, everything that you're seeing here is dealing with that last seven years. Because Paul said in 1 Thessalonians <clears throat> that the coming of the Lord will not happen until two things happen. <clears throat> Number one, a falling away first and the man of sin being revealed. Which you'll make a covenant with Israel. It, they will accept him as the Messiah. He'll make a covenant with Israel. They'll accept him as a Messiah. And half, halfway through that seven-year period, in the middle of the week, he's going to break that covenant with Israel. And then all hell is going to break loose. Literally. That's not just a phrase. Satan will be confined to this planet. 
those last three and a half years, and it's just gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a, an intense time. So he's talking about hail and fire, one third of trees. You got one third of the sea. You got third waters up made bitter. Daylight shortened by one third. In front, I mean, all kinds of things that are happening. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Back up to chapter six. White horse, red horse, black horse, pale horse. Look at verse. Um, look at. Um, 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 I want you to turn to chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal. Now this is the fifth seal. Keep that in mind. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for what? The word of God. And for what? Their and the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said of them that they should rest yet for a little while, for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So he's saying that these are people who stood upon the word of God and for the testimony that they have in Jesus Christ. And, and people will tell you after chapter 4, the church is not seen. They won't say these are tribulation saints. Well, if the church is gone and the Holy Ghost is gone, how are these people standing for the Word of God when they couldn't do it when the Word of God was here? So, you know, it's, it's a fallacy to think that these are, quote, tribulation saints. These are the saints, like you and me. These are people that hold to the testimony of Jesus Christ and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. All right, so then you look at uh, uh, chapter, two, uh, the sixth seal opens up the great day of the Lord and the wrath to come. So you're seeing this flow coming. Chapter 7 deals with the 144,000 that are sealed. Now, these are uh, specifically implied that these are Jewish in nature. These are Jews that will be converted to the testimony of Jesus Christ and have a, the seal of God in them. So the gospel is still being preached, and whether they are representative of a literal number or whether it's just a figurative number, we know that there is at least a certain number of Jews that will be converted to Christianity and the testimony of, of Jesus Christ. Now look at chapter 7, as he gives you all those. Now look at chapter verse, verse 9, and this I beheld, and lo, here's another, a great great multitude which no man could number number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their heads, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and upon the Lamb. And all the angels stood about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped, saying, Blessing and glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor and power and might be unto the God forever and ever. And so, uh, one of the elders answered, saying, hey, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, you know. And he said unto me, They are they which came out of great tribulation. You don't see the word the there, or the. These came out of great tribulation. I want you to know, Jesus said, In this world you shall what? Have great tribulation. I ask people over the years, what's the worst thing that can happen to you during the tribulation? You die? Well, I think there's something worse than that. You can be tortured before you die. But Okay, let's say, okay, are people dying for the cause of Jesus Christ right now? Amen. So if the worst thing that can happen to you in the great tribulation is to die, then are these people who are dying today in great tribulation? Absolutely. All it is is that as you approach the end time, there's always been tribulation against the kingdom of God. Jesus himself said it. You're going to have it. Now, in certain parts of the, of the world, it is significant right now in the Middle East. If you're a Christian, your life is on the line. Your children's lives are on the line. Right? Now, here in America, not so much. Right? So far. So, in different parts of the world, that intensity has always been there. As we approach the end, it's going to get more widespread. There's going to be more, more and more intensity against uh, the cause of Jesus Christ. 
And the Lord said, you need to be prepared for that. You need to be ready. He said, these came out of what? Great tribulation. What have they done? They washed their robes and made them white. How? In the blood of the Lamb. Well, these can't be tribulation saints because if the Holy Ghost is not here, the church is not here, according to pre-trib, how can these people be then? And he says, therefore, are they before the throne and serve him night and day in the temple? And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more. So you get a picture of what's going to happen. Now, where's the throne of God going to be? It's going to be here on this earth. Yeah. See, it never made sense to me. I did this kind of question. Okay, we get raptured out. We go, we go away for seven years. We sit at a banquet table and gorge ourselves on what? Pizza? <laughs> for seven years? Only to get up from the table to come back to this planet. And then other people say, well, we go to heaven. Well, who wants to leave heaven to come back to this planet for a thousand years? Raise your hand. See, that just doesn't, it's not going to happen that way. It can't happen that way. God's told us it's not going to happen that way. You're not going to leave your mansion next door to Jesus come down here and, you know, be an ambassador to Illyria. You're just not going to do that. If it happened that way. So, but it doesn't happen that way. So, so chapter 7 is you're getting, again, a bigger picture of what's going to happen with the saints. What you're seeing in chapter 7 is 144,000 sealed, but you also see the saints of the Most High who are honored and, and uh, uh, blessed because of that. So you, 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 you look at that. Now you go to chapter 8, 9, and 11. Uh, deal primarily with the seven trumpets. Now you're focusing in. Again, keep in mind that all this is transpiring within a seven-year period, and much of this is happening during the last three and a half years. So keep that in mind. We're not talking about a very long time. Now I was thinking about all the people that we're talking about will, will, will die during this time. Do you know that during the Black Plague... In Europe, in what was that, the 11, 1200s or whatever, 1300s, that was there, that it wiped out 100 million, it wiped out over half the population in Europe. Wiped out over half the population in Europe. That's like, that's like a one third of the United States just gone in, in a couple of years' time with a disease, with a virus. So keep that in mind. That we've had these things, and Jesus said you had had them, and as we approach the end, you're going to do that. Do you know that one-third of the, of the world's population, two and a half billion people, go to bed every night hungry? Not enough food to sustain them for that day. And tomorrow when they wake up, they will spend every moment of every waking hour trying to find enough food and enough water to sustain them for that day. It would not take much a famine anywhere in our world that is a crop producing nation for literally hundreds of millions of people to die of starvation. So keep that in mind when you read the book of Revelation. You will see these things. So you've got you've got the seven trumpets, <clears throat> and they tell you certain things. Again, you're coming down toward number seven, uh, six seal and seventh seal. Six seal opens up the seventh seal. That you have to combine those two. The seventh trumpet all say the same thing. All right. You've got chapter ten and eleven that deal with the two witnesses. Now the two witnesses come on the scene in uh, right right after. Um, the Antichrist, or the beast, breaks his covenant with Israel. So it's the last three and a half years. Two witnesses come on the scene, Enoch and Elijah. Why those two? Because the Bible says, and the Bible is true, it's appointed unto man once to die. There are only two individuals that did not die in the Old Testament, Enoch and Elijah. And they're going to be a witness against the Antichrist, because you see, he breaks his covenant in the, in the, in, in, in the middle of the week, these two witnesses come on the scene, Enoch and Elijah. They are a pain in the neck to the Antichrist. They are in Jerusalem. They're in that holy city. The Bible says that they're there. 
and they, they uh, dispense plagues and various other things to afflict it and just be a total irritation and an affliction to the Antichrist. He's got his image set up in the, in, in the temple there, and he's trying to pull things together. He wants everybody to worship him and all that sort of thing. So these two witnesses in chapters 10 and 11 are the thorn in the flesh for the Antichrist. And they prophesy and dispense plagues and other uh, things during that uh, three and a half years. The Bible says they exist for 42 months. So, well, Harper's is the church going to be able to see that? Yeah, we are. We're going to be around. Okay? We're going to see it. And um, so he's just telling you this is what's going to happen. So chapters 10 and 11 deal with the two witnesses in their ministry and what's going on. Chapter 11 comes back to the seventh comes back to the seventh trumpet. And the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet in the Bible. And according to, according to 1 Corinthians 15, at the last trump. So the last trumpet you, you read of in the whole of scriptures is the seventh trumpet. And it deals with the coming of the Lord. So the sixth and seventh seal deal with the coming of the Lord. You get this whole picture leading up to that. Then you, have, you start to narrow this down uh, a bit in the seven trumpets that are happening and it culminates in the seventh. So the sixth and seventh seal and the seventh trumpet are the same exact event. There's hail, there's earthquake, there's, there's uh, voices, there's thunder, there's lightnings, there's all kinds of things that are going on. And you read that in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation. All right, let's, um, let's look at chapter, uh, chapter 12 and 13. Kind of gives us, if we didn't have chapter 12, and especially chapter 12, we would not know about the, we would not uh, know about certain things that happened. But chapter 12 and 13 tells us a little bit about um, um, the war in heaven, tells us how Satan and, and how his kingdom came to be and how it fell. Then he talks about in chapters 12 and 13, the war in heaven and the war against the saints. And he also deals with the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. Now I want you to look at verse 9. And that great dragon that was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, and he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So here, here's a confining. Right now he has access to God, and he is the what? The accuser of the brethren. Did, 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 did not the scripture tell us, Paul says, that we fight against principalities and powers and rulers and high places and spiritual wickedness? All, there's certain levels of this. Well, the last three and a half years, they're confined to this planet. Can you imagine the devil and all his herds and what's going to go on? Because he knows he has but a short time. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night and day. Verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. I thought the church wasn't here after chapter 3. Well, who are these people overcoming the devil by what? The blood of the Lamb. So don't tell me that the gospel is still not being preached. And that the message that we hold dear to our hearts is still not... Does still, still has the power to convert people. <clears throat> and by the word of their testimony, what? <clears throat> and they love their lives, not unto death. Therefore, he says, rejoice ye heavens and them that dwell in them. The woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And of the seal of the devil has come down. And of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Here's the thing that, that I, I began to see. We always said in, in my teaching that, or that I was taught that the seven-year period was the wrath of God. It's great tribulation and the wrath of God. We preached it that way. People just scattered everything through that. I mean, you had hail falling in the first year and fire in the second year. I mean, just all kinds of stuff. How can you attribute the wrath of God to the wrath of Satan? The Bible makes it clear that the Antichrist is the wrath of Satan. Which is different than the wrath of God. So keep that in mind. So he says, and it, it, it does appear in the in the twelfth chapter, the latter part, that it says 
He knows he has but a short time, and he persecuted the woman that brought forth the man-child. And the woman were given two wings with a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a times from the face of the serpent. Now, that's for 42 months, and it just appears to me, and again, I don't have, I, I don't have co complete, clear insight into all of these things, but it does appear to me that there's a certain group, there's a certain percentage of God's people who will be protected from the enemy for 42 months. Some are going to be martyred, mm -hmm. and some are not. And he says, the servant cast out his mouth, a lot of water as a flood, after the woman that he might, be. and that woman here is the church. That's mentioned here. Look at verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went out to make war with the remnant of her seed. That means those who were not protected, which keep the covenants of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So evidently there's some people that are not going to be uh, afflicted with this and others that will. So then you, you look at the chapter 12, uh, 13 and it deals with the mark of the beast. Now let me just uh, add real quickly about that. The rest of this goes real quick. It seems to me that the mark of the beast, um, the Bible talks about the seal or the mark of the beast, which is, again, a counterfeit of what happens to the child of God. When we are born again, we are sealed with the Holy Ghost. We have a mark on us. And that is a name that's written in our life. And that name is Jesus Christ. There is a covenant. And that covenant that we, we make with Jesus Christ is the covenant of baptism. I know that a majority of Christian, Christian denominations uh, do not believe that water baptism has any significance at all. It's just an outward sign that something's already happened. It's more than that. Amen. It's sad that much of Christianity in the last 50 years has gravi gravitated away from what water baptism actually does for the saint of God. It is our covenant with God. Amen. In the Old Testament, the covenant with the people of God was circumcision of its males. Right. Paul makes it clear that water baptism is our spiritual covenant with Christ, which is the cutting away of the old flesh. And now a new creature has given, has been given, a new creation has been given to us. So our seal and our covenant with Christ is water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So it just, it, it just, it's, even though it's not, gives us all the particulars here about the mark of the beast. It seems to me, in, in light of the fact that everything that Satan does here in the book of Revelation is a counterfeit of what Christ is. Right. And the church. So the false church, the, the kingdom of this world, the mystery of Babylon, I believe in order to take the mark, it's more than just getting a stamp in your hand and on your forehead. There is some kind of spiritual covenant that these people make with him. And the reason I believe that is because when you look over a little bit later, when, when uh, uh, the Battle of Armand again takes, uh, takes place, the Bible makes it very clear that those who take the mark are destroyed at the brightness of the coming of the Lord. It's very specific of uh, who is against God. Because it can't be everybody, folks. It can't be everybody taking the mark or an either or. If you take the mark, you get your head cut off. It can't be. Because then there wouldn't be anybody for us to rule over, would there? The logic stands to reason that the Bible says there's going to be nations and people here when he comes back again, that have not taken the mark. Right. Now, will there be specific pressure applied to Christians to renounce Christianity? Absolutely. But there, there, there's something that's going on here with, it, with this mark. All right, let's go quickly to uh, chapters uh, 15 and 16. Deal specifically with the wrath of God. The seven last plagues. And now you get a condensed version of this. I mean, there's things that are happening, and I will say that a lot of the ugliness and nastiness that we read in the book of Revelation is happening in the last three and a half years. So there's going to be distresses. There's going to be, it's like Paul says, the cre all of God's creation in this world is like a woman travailing with, with child, getting ready to give birth to something. 
And so there's travail, there's upheaval, there's earthquake, there's all kinds of stuff that's going on. People are dying. All of this is going on. So in chapters 15 and 16, it deals specifically with the seven bowls of wrath. And it says this is the wrath of God. And, um, and he tells us here, well, and let me just say, add in chapter 14, I want you to do this. Uh, chapter 14 gives us two reapings. It gives us the reaping of the church and the reaping of the Ar battle of Armageddon or the, the uh, wrath of God into the wine press, which is the battle of Armageddon. So chapter 14 gives us two reapings. 15 and 16 gives us the, uh, the seven bowls of wrath. Now look at uh, chapter 16. I want you to read right here. Um, uh, verse 13 says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of the Lord. What's he talking about there? Armageddon. Behold, I come as a thief. To who? Not to the church. To them. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see a shame. And he gathered them together into the place of the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. So this is this is the and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne of God. It is done. There were voices, thunders, lightnings, and a great earthquake, and there was not since the man was upon the earth. So what you have is the sixth and seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl of wrath, all saying the exact same thing. They are not three separate events. It is the same event. You're getting a big picture with the seals. You're getting a more condensed version with the trumpets. And then you get a really condensed version at the end of the seven bowls of wrath. So he gives that to you. And then chapter 17, is uh, he tells you that Babylon is described. The mystery Babylon. What is that? Well, you know, it can be... The Bible talks about... Abraham looking for a city whose builder and maker was what? God. Did he see it? No, he didn't see it in his day. And then Hebrews tells us that here, here we have no continuing city. Our city. So when he says, and when, when, when the angel got ready to show John the bride, he says, I, I took me up on the mountain and he showed me the bride. He said, come see the bride. I'm the bride. And then he said, took me up on the mountain. What did he show him? A city. So a city is representative of the church or the people of God, the people of faith. Well, when you look at chapter 17 and you talk about mystery Babylon and the city of Babylon, we're talking about, I think, primarily, not that there's not a specific city, but I think we're talking primarily about a system and a false church. So he describes that in chapter 17. In chapter 18, you see the destruction of, you see the destruction of Babylon. And look at what it says. Uh, <clears throat> well, in verse 17, he comes back and he says the ten in church, verse 12, the ten horns and the ten kings and all of that. And they have one mind, shall give their power and strength unto the beast, and they shall make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. What's that talking about? Battle of Armageddon. Um Look at chapter 18, verse 8. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and shall utterly burn with fire. For strong is the Lord who hath judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her. Now, it could be very well a specific city, but there's also a system here that the, that the kings of the earth are bewailing. And what system is that? A system built on mammon, on money. What did Jesus say? You can't serve God and mammon. What is this world based on? Mammon, greed, money. So you got a, you've got a system here. Verse 17, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. So he's talking about a day the plagues come and in an hour she falls. All right, we're coming to the, we're coming to the close of this. Chapter 19 deals with the marriage supper of the Lamb. We dealt with that last, last week about the armies of the Lord, and that the marriage supper of the Lamb is the battle of Armageddon. That is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's where we have complete victory over our enemies. And we feast on our enemies. The Bible says that the valley of Jehoshaphat, 200 miles long, 50 miles wide, 
will be filled with enough people and blood to flow to a horse's bridle. That's four feet deep. Four and a half feet deep. 200 miles long, 50 miles wide. And so that's going to be, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. So then you look at verse, the chapters 20, 21, and 22. You, deep, you see the millennial reign. And uh, you look at verse 20, and it says, But the rest of the dead live not again, chapter of uh, verse 5, until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Talk about those that are resurrected and that we, we uh, uh, rule and reign. Blessed and holy is he that take, take part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's what we do. We're going to reign with him a thousand years. Then after a thousand years expired, verse 7, Satan is released. He deceives the nations again. They gather at the battle of Gog and Magog. Fire comes out of heaven, devours them. They gather there, and that's the end of time as we know it. Now, I could, um, um, the devil is, is cast into the lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. ever. Verse 11 says the great white throne. That means everybody who's lived up to that time gets resurrected and then books are opened and they're judged out of the books. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21, a new heaven and a new earth. So now there's, a, there's something new going on. Let me just close with this here. It seems to me when you read chapter 22, now you can read it for yourself, but it seems to me that humanity still lives after the one great white throne judgment. And that there'll be nations. Now, we don't know who these people are. So, I mean, there's supposition as to who these, these nations are. But if you look at chapter 22, verse 2, in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. 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 Hmm. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There'll be no more night. And he says, um, and he begins to t tell us that... Uh, that, that, that these things are happening. And, and then he also says uh, here, um, uh, where is this? Um, where it says that if that, you, you know, that the nations, that the, the holy city is preserved for those who are the, the, of the kingdom of heaven, right? And that the nations are not allowed into that city, but that they bring their offerings and their sacrifices to the city, and no sin can enter into that city, right? So it says, no sin can enter in there. So there, there appears to be, in, in my understanding, that uh, there, there may be continued nations. Time, time will not be a factor as an issue anymore as far as our, our, our world is concerned. Um, but there, there does appear to be a continued nation. Uh, oh, yeah, look, look at chapter 21, the last few verses. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, talking about the city. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut all, at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall no wise enter in, into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever maketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The only people allowed in the city are you and me. So there seems to be some back and forth. We have access to the planet, but they don't have access to the city. Now, you know, God didn't tell us absolutely everything, but he did give us an overview and a picture of it. And so... That's my thinking. You're welcome to believe whatever you want to believe, with one exception. You have to believe in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, literally, because he is coming. If you pre, mid, post, doesn't matter to me. I'm telling you what I think, and you know my whole point is, is that I want, to, I, I, want, I want the people of God to be ready and to be strong and to be of good courage. And whatever we may face here in America and in the Western world, we will stand firm like our brothers and sisters in the Middle East are doing today. Amen. 
that Joey did not get. Yes. No, no, that's just the nation of the world. No, not us. We're Bible. A uh, verse says that uh, you know we're we're already uh, we're already uh, rewarded. We're rewarded at the second coming of the Lord. We are rewarded not based on salvation because salvation is free and the gift of God is eternal life, but we we are rewarded for what the deeds done in our body, good or bad. That we we are rewarded. So he's been faithful a few things, make you rule over many, whether it's one city, five cities, ten cities, or whatever God has in plan, plan for us to do that. And that's a reward. It's not, it has nothing to do with eternal life because we've already been granted eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then comes the judgment of the nations, the goat nations and the sheep nations. So there's still some good nations around, right? Yeah. Right? There's still some nations that were sheep, not goats. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this time together and for this series. I pray.